C'est qui Qui C'est qui qui n'a studio Hello everyone, welcome to this new episode of Jeans Podcast. The very first podcast that tackles love, sexuality, feminism and gender intertwined with Arab and or Muslim identities. Today's episode deals with an issue that can be perceived violently, so brace yourselves. It is about colonization and its relation to sexuality and masculinity. If we read thoroughly Australian sociologist Rowan Connell, hegemonic masculinities were constructed as white, while subordinate masculinities were reserved for people of color, less close to the ideal and closer to deviance. It's also important to adopt an intersectional point of view here, since we'll be talking about a history that has been told for decades by the ones who colonized, overshadowing the reality of the ones who were colonized and seeking freedom from the oppressor. Yet, the fear of ideological rape and territorial penetration has grown in French people's minds since the 50s. Algerian hypervirility was opposed to a crisis of French masculinity thought to be the cause of defeat in Algeria. The far right presented itself as the possibility of restoring a virile authority versus the, quote, twinks and, quote, dandies of May 68, who were deemed as too effeminate to fight against the Arab invasion. Apparently, it would have given the figure of the Algerian pimp, an engine of the Arab invasion in France, according to the far right, and that of the Maghrebi immigrant worker whose hypersexuality and sexual misery would lead to the need to resort to prostitutes and to relentlessly rape white women. So I'm very happy to have an enlightening chat today with Todd Shepard. Todd Shepard is a professor of history at John Hopkins University in Baltimore, USA. In 2008, he wrote The Invention of Decolonization, The Algerian War, and The Remaking of France. And he co-wrote Guerre d'Algérie, Le Sexe Outragé, with Catherine Brun, in 2016. In 2017, his book, Sex, France, and Arab Men, 1962-1979, has become, in English-speaking academic environments, the new reference on how sexual orientalism re-emerged in post-decolonization French politics. So he's the best person to go to for a nice discussion on French far-right politics, May 68, prostitution, gay rights, sexual libertinism, and the question of rape also, explicitly grappled with questions of imperialism, the Algerian war, colonial violence, and post-decolonization racism. Dear Todd, thank you so much for responding positively to my invitation. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So, to start off on the topic of the French perception of virility and sexuality for Arab men, can you give us a clear view on what changed between the colonial era in North African countries and the post-independence era from 1956? Yes. So, my work really draws heavily on a discussion that was really crystallized through Orientalism, you know, Edward Said's Orientalism, which comes out right at the end uh, of the 1970s in English and quite quickly thereafter in French. Um, Edward Said is trying to map out uh, the emergence and the crystallization of a set of claims, the interconnecting claims that position something called the Orient uh, as having a coherence to it. Uh, and a coherence that, you know, in his definition, above all, serves to cement the idea that there's something called the West. To try to define something called the Orient that encompasses uh, what could be called the Muslim world, uh, that might be referred to as, you know, the so-called, you know, in reference to 
Europe, uh, the Middle East or North Africa, the Near East, uh, et cetera, that you know, he said, wants to make a claim that this entirely set, this diverse set of peoples, cultures, civilizations, countries, states, et cetera, get lumped together into something called the Orient that scholars have tried to explore sexual Orientalism. Uh, and so this is about the ways that gender uh, and sexuality, generally speaking, uh, are defined in these Orientalist discussions, these you know, primarily at this point, when they emerge, these so-called Western-centered uh, discussions about the so-called Orient. So that they participate in producing their idea that there's something called the Orient uh, that's Muslim, Arab, something uh, that has some unity to it. And they tend to fixate on forms of aberration. Uh, aberration that therefore comfort the idea that the West is a place where gender and sexual norms are normal <laughs> and good and universal, uh, potentially, uh, and that they increasingly that in the West, these things then allow us to think about and talk about people as individuals, whereas in the so-called Orient, they're never able to be individuals because they're caught up in these aberrant forms of both masculinity and femininity. You tends to fixate on women, girls, females, and the feminine or femininity. This has been the kind of dominant mode. But Said, Edward Said, and many other people since have also noted his attention to the ways that questions of masculinity, men, boys, and males is also part of this and defined as aberrant. Uh, one of the things that I was looking at and one of the things that kind of gave some chronological boundaries and meaning to the period that I was looking at, which is really focused on you know, the particular moment of Algeria's independence and crystallizing something that I think, as you were right to point out, you know, has emerged in French and larger discussions, uh, French language, France itself, larger discussions in the 1950s. And that's an increasing attention, and I do argue, you know, after Algerian independence in France, a kind of fixation on males, men and boys, uh, and masculinity uh, in ways that kind of take over from the usual, more typical fixation on females and femininity. So again, you know, I'll just reference some obvious markers here. Uh, the veil, uh, the job, uh, the harem, uh, kind of women's oppression, women as deeply oppressed and kind of suffering under Puritanism, women as refusing their bodies, uh, women as deeply licentious, and you know, eager to have sex, uh, signaled by the hair. So all of those forms, and you can see these aberrant forms of extreme types of femininity, of presentations of womanly, womanliness. Um, uh, and it's usually these two like poles of extremes. And Westerners, to reassure themselves, is to say, the West is in the middle. <laughs> like the West is normal. So people can be all sorts of variations on being a woman or being a girl in this discussion or being feminine. Whereas in the Orient, it's either one or the other. It's either women who are completely pushed to the side of Puritanism, uh, puritanical, pudeur, you know, being incredibly modest and refusing to be exposed versus and then the belly dancer, the harem, you know, the extreme. So the same thing then is true of men, males, and masculinity uh, in the classic, in the kind of longer term and still resonant, understand Orientalist depictions of Oriental masculinity, Oriental men, so-called, uh, and boys and, and, and males, which is the usual historically important uh, ways of talking about this, have both fixated on Oriental, Arab, Muslim, men, boys, masculinity, as torn between two other you know, seemingly paradoxical versions of the hyperviral brute, you know, driven by sex, driven to rape and abuse women, driven to rape and abuse boys and other men to humiliate them, uh, driven by sexuality, driven in a kind of form of self-production uh, as ultra-viral incarnating some form of animal masculinity, and the afib, uh, the dancing boy, the kind of the, pa the pale, hairless, feminine male, uh, who is some kind of, who's open to having sex with other men, to be taken by other men, <clears throat> who lacks any characteristic that seems to typify, or is taken to typify, what it is to be a male, to be masculine, et cetera. So again, these two extreme poles where the middle space is supposedly then occupied by Westerners, or at least those who are understood to be Western. 
So in the 60s and 70s, in my in my analyses of the French discussions I was studying, which and what you see instead is this production of an intense attention to ultra virility, what the French would call hyper virility, uh, excess, too much manliness, uh, or an extreme version of the pre of presentation. So in the longer history of this, and this is something that okay, is important to kind of grab onto uh, with Edward Said's understanding of Orientalism, most Orientalism is negative in intention. It's meant to condemn and therefore to celebrate Westerners. So Todd, I would like to ask you um, what relationship can we forge between colonization and sexuality? Is there a way we can link the errors of a people before and after it's been colonized? I'm asking you this question because when I studied decolonial feminism and asked brilliant essayists like Françoise Vergès, I learned about so many atrocities that were perpetrated by the French on Arab men and women, from rape of children to emasculation, literally cutting their balls and enslaving them, or even how North African immigrants were suffering from erotic dysfunction and impotence after leaving their country for France. Again, does colonization induce sexual domination? So on the one hand, sexual orientalism in the Saidian conception uh, as more broadly Orientalism, uh, is a set of claims and arguments and affirmations about the truth of the world that work incredibly, in incredibly efficient ways to anchor and explain why the West therefore should take over and control these people. Uh, the Orient is incapable. And so this is where sex and gender play a particularly crucial role in Orientalism writ large and kind of bring to a fine point things that happen in other claims about your science, about government more broadly, about philosophy, about religion. Um, that is, there's claims that because of their forms of aberration, how they treat women, how they think about femininity, and how men are, they are proving themselves incapable of becoming modern, incapable of governing themselves, incapable of being part of, fully part of, you know, a, an organized world uh, that's moving forward and making progress. They're incapable of mastering themselves, <laughs> of having the type of control that would be required to participate fully in a capitalist economy, of having the type of, type of self-discipline that would allow them to participate fully in democratic or liberal governance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, and so then this is linked to a whole set of forms of, of abuse, denigration, and colonialism, of course, removes all sorts of power at, at every level of life from people. All of these things uh, that you, you, know, you just talked about uh, in terms of forms of direct physical violence, uh, of mass rape, uh, of you know, widespread sexual violence, both during colonial, colonialism writ large. Uh, we know, for example, that in Algeria, torture uh, became a fairly regular and really thought out part of policing in the 1930s. Uh, so in the interwar period, as economic conditions become quite difficult uh, in Algeria, as it is in so many colonized spaces, as in so much of the world uh, in the wake of the Great Depression, but particularly intensely in the colonies, that allowed people in colonial spaces to really see Western claims that their colonial uh, domination was in fact bringing great benefits, <laughs> was even more untrue, more, more clearly unfounded than, than they previously had thought. And then becomes, you know, in the case of Algeria, infamously torture just so systematic and so central to French efforts to stop the Algerian revolution uh, from succeeding and to therefore identify all sorts of people as potential in complicity with the outlaws, uh, with the so-called terrorists, et cetera. And certainly sexual torture, that is torture that's that, uh, targeted sex organs uh, and that played on sexual fantasies on the part of the torturers, you know, these were key things. This is particularly one of those wide, widespread idea, which gets repeated quite often, that the FLN, the National Liberation Front uh, that was fighting for Algeria's independence and that launched the Algerian Revolution that led it to victory, was obsessed with masculinity. It was obsessed with restoring Algerian masculinity. That there was some kind of that Algerian masculinity had been denied and humiliated. And the idea that they're being stripped of their masculinity is just a far right fantasy that then has been taken up as the basis for claims that this actually explains something. 
And so that this, so this is there's a French set of fantasies. There's a French set of claims <laughs> about masculinity that are at play. There's just as there are French set of claims about femininity that are at play and intense. We have very little evidence that Algerians themselves were concerned about the, what the French were doing to their role as men or to their role as women. They were worried about what the French were doing to their role as human beings, <laughs> more writ large, that was never possible. As we know from Fanon's description of the Manichaeism, that denies any true humanity to the colonizer. The far-right party in France was indeed obsessed with Arab masculinity, and they saw it as a national danger as much as rooted in a sexual perversion. So they wanted to fight against the Algerianization of France, And this would mean, in their imagination, the automatic rape of poor white little girls and the emasculation of French distinguished men. On the other side, we had the French New Left, la Nouvelle Gauche Française, who meanwhile elevated the model of the heroic Algerian man as an incarnation of the revolutionary immigrant worker, which is, I think, a bit patronizing also, And I'm not sure it is completely empty of other tropes on Arab men either. So correct me if I'm wrong, but French socialists were seen as too soft, um, sometimes even portrayed as sissies. And the French ultra-nationalists wanted to re-viralize French men with a so-called normal virility, while they would save women from them white women or Arab women, because as Gayatri Spivak formulated it, they are white men saving brown women from brown men. Yeah. So one of the things I'm interested but I try to talk about uh, in my in my book you know, is uh, the ways that, again, this form of Arabophilia, uh, which has a long history, it's, I think, crucially captured uh, within the concept of Orientalism, uh, this idea that they, uh, you know, in this case, the Arabs or the Algerians, have something special that's different and better gets reworked uh, in this moment. And what I'm particularly interested in how it gets reworked during the revolution itself in the context of anti-colonial revolution and struggle uh, into a political version, a certain fringe of the left, and this will become, I think, more important over time, begins to identify Algerian men were the kind of embodiment of a revolutionary hero. They could be a model for French people writ large, uh, and in particular to French men. Certain left-wing French discussions will say, look, here we have an idea of the ideal man who can be a model of how to get us out of this situation. They can create revolution, and we can see this. And so here you'll get a discussion which does fixate on the way that torture by the French army, by the French police, by French authorities that's fixated on Algerians is particularly sexualized. And a representation of Algerian men, however, that is wholly resistant to this, able to overcome. So I'm intrigued by how this emergence of the Algerian man as emblematic of what I call, and I think as I identify with in the 60s and 70s, is a larger part of a French left wing, kind of on the margins, the so-called new left, as you said, admiration of the Arab revolution writ large. So the Arab revolution is something that kind of has its emergence as a world-changing force in the Algerian revolution, but other moments of independence with Nasserism and certain of its forms, and then gets renovated and reignited by the Palestinian revolution and the Palestinian revolts of the late 60s and early 70s. You know, once the PLO takes its post-69 kind of shift towards an, an embrace of armed struggle, Uh, and nationalism uh, as, a, as forms of resistance, how this Arab revolution produces the heroic uh, Arab man as a model, a kind of political model that is deeply linked to forms of masculinity and to forms of sexuality. After the decolonization, there was a surge of social hostility towards microbi men in France, based on the idea that they would be closer to bestiality and animality, that they would be prone to delinquency and sexual deviation, that they are parasites that invade the territory 
that they are barbarians who rape white women and impregnate Arab women with dozens of children, that they are loud, that they are dirty and nasty, etc., etc. So the question is, how is this even possible, knowing that France is depicted worldwide as the country of human rights, of equality, of the freedom of the people, and, of course, of universalism, meaning that every human is born with equal rights regardless of their individual identity. Right. So one of the things I try to explore in the book is how this kind of far-right language and set of claims that it anchors itself quite quickly after the end of French domination of the Maghreb. So after it, which, you know, again, 56 is a key moment, obviously, and then 1962 kind of completes the at least formal decolonization of France's uh, North African colonies. In the 1960s, quite quickly, the the far right, one of the elements of the far right that emerges is a more broadly a fixation on masculinity, that only truly masculine people can be leaders, uh, that virility is absolutely crucial, and that there's many people, even if they're biologically male, so-called, can't fulfill that. There's only a few people, and it's really difficult uh, and hard work. The usual, the usual far right thing is to think that there's very few people that can do this. Uh, the people in general, the masses are by definition for most far right theorists uh, and politicians feminine, therefore irrational. So they don't believe in democracy, right? I mean, the, the far right historically in France is against the French Republic, is against all of these values, is against individualism, is against the citizen, you know, believes that there are defined groups, that there's a natural, natural hierarchy, uh, either ordained by God or by nature. Uh, etc. But there is a tradition and it becomes more important after 1945 uh, for obvious reasons because the far right too, and certainly the far right today, at least much of it, the Marine Le Pen version at least, uh, you know, presents itself as deeply Republican, you know, and tied to the French Republic. And that's something that has a post-1945, that is the end of World War II and the defeat of the Nazis and the defeat of collaboration and the Vichy uh, history, kind of more Republican strand is particularly interested in a different understanding which is that perhaps the French people could be masculinized, could be virilized, so that modern society, whether it's the Republic or liberal democracy or capitalism or consumerism, has reduced people's capacity to be truly male. So they're going to fix it on the Algerian invasion, the Arab invasion of France as this threat that reproduces the threat that Algeria, Algerian revolutionaries had posed during the Algerian Revolution that the French had lost. So the far right will present a history of the Algerian war as one that was a battle between two visions of masculinity, a healthy, normal French version, which we would recognize as deeply reactionary, you know, old school, uh, just misogynist, toxic masculinity, but they present as this is the best. Uh, and this horrifically, as you, know, as you noted, kind of animalistic, savage form of Arab masculinity. The French version, the superior version, lost because it was betrayed and stabbed in the back. Speaking of, I wanted to uh, point out this fact. Is it fair to say that France had been portrayed at the time as a young white virgin or at least a feminine figure? even a motherly figure with this topless Marianne as the highest symbol of the Republic. Whereas on the other side, North African countries had been pictured as a hyper-masculine power with a brainless close to animal virility. And that this was the reason the French thought they had lost these territories. Like, I think that there's a French far right attempt to redefine what was at stake. You know, give a fake history of the Algerian war that it was about, in this case, or about decolonization in general, uh, that it's about these men trying to impose their aberrant forms of masculinity in France failing. Now, for the French far right, it, the Republic is a goose, like the Republic, it's, it's, it's a slut. <laughs> like they, they see the Marianne that you're describing, dude, is, is indicative of what's wrong with France, <laughs> you know, that France thinks it could be embodied by that rather than the person of the king. You know, so uh, this very kind of minoritarian French far right obsession with presenting this as a battle between types of ma males, between civilized, uh, you know, superior forms of masculinity that have been bizarrely and uh, inexplicably beaten by these Arab, you know, 
animal forms of masculinity that could only be explained, therefore, by the effeminacy and the failure of French leadership. And for me, my May 1968 plays a key point in kind of reinserting these far right claims that are obsessed with North African masculinity and its supposed aberrations into larger discussions, notably on the right. Uh, so how they're going to try to interpret and how other people will try to interpret what happened in May 68 in France, these forms of upheaval. Uh, and so they'll do that in part by fixating on, once again, on French effeminacy and French failures to be masculine. And instead of the fact that women played a key role as political actors is by definition an indication that there's something wrong with this event, right? That there's something unnatural, there's something aberrant, there's something demasculating. You know, if women are being part of are part of it and playing any kind of role at all, that must prove, you know, that there's something deeply wrong, aberrant, you know, effeminate, yeah, unmasculine about the event itself. According to the French, another thing that made the Arab men play a central role in the national sexual disorientation, pun intended, was their role in the gay liberation movement. It seems that the Algerian Revolution for Independence, 1954 to 1962, coincided with the sexual revolution in France. It feels like it's inextricably linked. You had also activists from the FAR, the homosexual front of revolutionary action, who drew parallels between their oppression and the one suffered by North African immigrants. Can you elaborate? Can you tell us more about this? So it's important to understand, like in French discussions, like Orientalist discussions writ large, uh, there'd always been a kind of constant effort to attach oriental masculinity uh, to what we would call homosexuality. This was on the two extremes, right? So on the one hand, you had the effeminate and the effe and the ephib, who was seen as therefore open to being sexually penetrated, dominated by other men. Uh, the Arab boy is this whole fantasy figure. And that and the, the, the very existence of the Arab boy and this other figure is linked then to the hyper virile brute. Any hole that moves is open, is available. And, and to use sex as a form of domination. In the 1960s, uh, the same kind of far-right theorists, publications, journalists, etc., will try to explain the emergence of any of a kind of publicly visible gay subculture uh, in Paris or elsewhere as a direct result of Arab immigration. So the, this is what the Algerian immigration is bringing to. Like We didn't have these people before, uh, and now it's because of Algerian immigrants that these people or North African immigrants that these gay people, these gay men in particular, are being homosexuals are more visible. Now, one of the things that then happens with these new radical, both the feminist movement, which takes on new forms uh, and has a much wider remit than a kind of fixation on the vote that had typified the earlier feminist movement, but this new radical feminist movement, but then the new gay liberationist movement too, is their ad ad adoption of a political analysis of gender and sexual norms. In the early 70s in France, particularly after 1971, uh, we'll say there's sex is political. Sexuality is political. It's historical. It's something that's shaped by society. It's a result of forms of capitalism, of the imperialist societies that we live in. And so they will begin to claim that the type of liberation that they want is not just for themselves as homosexuals, but in fact, because of their position as homosexuals, who are one of the, therefore, the most reviled uh, and mistreated groups around sexuality in society, denied the right to kind of even openly proclaim who they are, that they in fact are a revolutionary class, that they suffer what everyone suffers for, the new left in France at this moment, that the Arab man is the most revolutionary person, the Arab man or Arab men or whoever, or Arab boy, they're supposed to incarnate some kind of revolutionary consciousness. And so it's supposed to be both as in the French, in this French discussion that's emerged by the 1970s, you know, both heirs of these revolutionary struggles that have defeated France, you know, that drove France out of Tunisia, of Morocco, and finally Algeria, that beat imperialism, that beat capitalism, you know, that provide this model 
for how to struggle there. But then also the Algerian and the North African immigrant worker, the immigrant workers category, as a truly revolutionary working class group, rather than the kind of French working class or the European or the Western working classes that have been lulled into some kind of false consciousness by the benefits of consumer society, you know, post-war social democracy or Christian democracy, et cetera. So that the Arab man is then widely on the new left. You're seen as this revolutionary force. So they want to say, we are a revolutionary class and we can prove this in part because we, they claim, homosexual men in France have a particularly intense connection or real connection, unlike most on the left, with Arab men, and it is sexual. So they'll make a claim that, in fact, we have sexual encounters with Arab men. Now, this is a long-standing discussion. Yeah, and wasn't it the source of what we think today that Arab gay men should be tops and French white gay men should be bottoms, though? Right. And so particular, it, the fantasy is particularly striking at that moment. The, these, these activists, these are these political militants, uh, you know, activists want to say we are not like André Gide. We're not like Pierre Loti. We're not like all these other people, <laughs> that like, all these other French authors, uh, whether it, and Oscar Wilde and such, who have gone to North Africa historically in the context of French empire uh, and use their position to or do forms of sexual tourism that are about French men going and taking advantage of Arab boys, taking advantage of the forms of sexual passivity and effeminate masculinity that supposedly are typical of the Orient. They're when, instead, they're going to buy into the other end of the stereotype and say, no, no, we are here. We are getting, as the manifesto said, the manifesto of 343 syllabus is, you know, sluts, uh, is it's called, we get fucked by them. In the context of France, these men, these North African men here are facing so much racism, so much oppression, and so much sexual misery. They're denied access to women. And we, because we are being denied, we, the homosexual men, these homosexual French men are being denied uh, pleasure, forms of normal relationships. We too can seize this opportunity. So they're going to say it's, there's a political and historical context which is reduced and perverted, we could say, uh, both groups. North African men have been reduced in their sexual possibilities, in, particularly in the context of racist colonialist France, and then after colonialism, uh, and gay men too. Uh, and so they, the ways that we've been perverted are complementary, <laughs> since we can both get off on this encounter. And so, yeah, there is this deep fantasy then about the Arab top, white, French gay man, uh, who therefore plays the role at the bottom, and that this allows both people to, both groups to kind of get off. And the FAR, the Homosexual Front for Revolutionary Action, will claim that this has political implications. But let's remember that it's deeply racist, <laughs> fetishistic, fetishizing, you know, reductive, stereotyped, etc. cetera. Uh, it's a fantasy, right? and it's, it's a wrong-headed fantasy. Um, so it's an absolute fantasy that's based on this very reductive version And I think you're right to point out the kind of tenacity of the stereotypes around who plays what role uh, that it kind of anchors. Last question, because we talked a lot about uh, North Africa, but the Iranian Islamic Revolution in 1979 also ushered a new era in a way. It's marked a turning point for French thinkers and It almost caused part of the left to stop speaking positively about Arabs and or Muslims because of the repressive policy pursued by the Iranian regime uh, at the time towards women and homosexuals. Um, so what was the vision of Islam at this time? Was Islam instrumentalized as a permissive religion that would allow misogyny versus Catholics who would protect the virginal aura of their women and who would never fall into the devil's trap of sodomy and, and misogyny and homosexual behavior. Is it correct to say that Islamophobia also arrived later on with debates on the veil in 9-11? As we've noted, this is then linked to on the far left, on the one hand, on the far right, you know, to a type of vilification 
uh, of Arabs uh, and the Algerian inv invasion as forms of you know, sexual abusers, of rapists, of people that sexually harass men, boys, and women, and girls, and therefore threatening to invade France, and by invasion, of course, in territory as well as bodies, homes, etc. So that by the end of the 1970s, this left-wing heroic era, the kind of revolutionary Arab man, is collapsed. It's it's there's so many contradictions that it begins to fall apart. So I argue that this becomes that crystallizes around French reactions and Western reactions to the Iranian Revolution, notably to its triumph uh, in early in the early in early 1979. Is that the 50s and 60s in particular, and definitely the 1970s, like people are just not that interested in religion in France. They're not that interested in laïcité. Like people just don't talk about it that much. There's very little interest in Islam. There is dumb during the Algerian Revolution. By the 60s and 70s, people are just not that concerned. They talk about Arabs. So 1979, I think, is really compelling because in response to the triumph of the Iranian Revolution, uh, and notably around a cr criticism, an intense criticism of people, and especially of the philosopher Michel Foucault, who had shown interest, who said there's something that we can learn from what's happening here, the Iranian Revolution in, in particular. We can learn from the heroic Arab man. We can learn from the Algerian revolutionaries. We can learn from North Africans in France. They, this group of stereotype group of people, you have political understandings, models, ways of being men, ways of thinking about sex and gender that can teach French people, Westerners, the French left, the left in general, any revolutionary can teach people things. So that what emerges here so you have, for example, this whole set of debates that had been part of the crisis that kind of undermined and it led to the collapse of this version of the heroic kind of Arab revolutionary male uh, as a model around things like pedophilia, around things like rape, around things like prostitution, proxenetism, pimping, etc. These have been crucial debates in the 1970s. So some people in the French media, in response to what are quickly identified within the first weeks of the, of the triumph of the uh, Iranian revolution as what they're saying is the execution of homosexual men and the repression, the intense repression that is being subjected, that, that, that Iranian women are being subjected to through the veil and forced failing. And instead, there's a French left wing, in this case, response, which says, no, this is a religion, you know, both like both the new pope, John Paul II, uh, and Ayatollah Khomeini are both representatives of this form of religious oppression. That will get debated. But they'll above all say that you know, they are suffering, they are attacking homosexuals, they are attacking women. We, the French left, and we can identify who the good Iranians are. We don't need to learn something from what's happening over there. We already have what we need to explain this situation. So there's that, I think, the reemergence in a very intense way of there's nothing to learn. Revolutionary politics is now again inscribed into, this is about Islam. This is about feudalism. This is about religion. These are about not political ways of understanding the world, but ways of refusing politics by inserting people into religious, theological, naturalistic schemas that reduce women to this, that reduce homosexuals to abnormal, etc. So there's one hand, there's an insistence that again, the French left has lessons to give. We have nothing to learn from these people. We can be allies with those who are we agree with. But then the other big shift, and this goes directly to what you were talking about uh, in terms of the kind of important debates around the veil, uh, is the return to the forefront of the Muslim woman. So rather than the heroic Arab man, or even the uh, Arab man as rapist, uh, as invader, uh, as you know, sexual threat, it's again women, the treatment of women, the double combination of either sexual perversion and deep puritanism that is always kind of being mobilized around how femininity, and in this case in particular, the veil is presented and discussed, reemerges at the center. So I think the Iranian Revolution plays a really key crystallis role of crystallizing these debates. Muslim boys and men, or Muslim understandings of masculinity, of hypervirility, for example, of this idea that there's a Kind of competition between forms of masculinity that we often you know, in France are often described around you know the police like French policemen or gendarmes uh, and the ways that they deal with uh, young like boys and young men uh, in the in the so-called suburbs or just on the streets of Paris um, 
who are presumed to be of Muslim culture, or at least of so-called immigrant or North African or African cultures and people, you know, that the forms of humiliation that they're inflicting, uh, the obsession that you see in someone like Eric Zemmour, but, you know, the current French, um, you know, it, there's no reason to read anything that he's written, but um, this, like his, his, he's just obsessed with sodomy. Like he's obsessed with the, with kind of so-called North African masculinity and it's, it's ostentatious religious signs, i.e. The so-called Islamic veil, this ostentatious virility that supposedly typifies, uh, you know, people from the suburbs, the banlieue, uh, young men in particular. He's obsessed with it, like uh, you know. So it's 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 intriguing. Uh, so I think there are continuities. Here, but there's also something different, and it's like that that the kind of post-independence, post-decolonization moment did offer different possibilities, different forms of stereotypes. Uh, that have something interesting about them that are, I think have some discontinuities with today, but also I think allow us to see some rel relatively clearly the kind of ongoing fixation uh, on sex and gender as ways to disqualify, discredit, you know, deny and denigrate people uh, who might just have different ways of living their lives. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Todd. We're going to wrap this up. But first, in every single episode of Jeans, we debunk a myth that I've been told or that I've often heard of. Here's what a straight white woman told me three years ago in a bar in Paris. She said, look, I've always found Arab men sensual, fierce, rough, and exotic. This is my desire. I like them when they go wild. I'm not saying I hate them. I'm saying I love them. What's wrong with that? What would you have answered if you were me? I mean, A, it's just, it's a fantasy about working class men uh, that has always been present in bourgeois discussions. I mean, part of what's you know striking, one of the things I try to reference here is that it's possible to go into these, oh, it's about Islam, it's about this, but I don't know. Islam doesn't, you know, it's not a it's not a deadly sin to, you know, sodomy is bad, but it's not good or types of or sex or the orgasm is the only way to have access to what paradise is like or something. But in fact, all the fantasies that we have about how working class or popular in the French term, you know, kind of working class men in general live their lives and live their sexuality are, are the same version. This idea that they are not constrained by bourgeois norms. Uh, so it's just it's a it's a fantasy that that is you know about working class. It's about slumming one can have all sorts of anecdotes about how I, well, this person, this person, this person, but it's like any stereotype. It's incredibly reductive. It's fake, facing a presumption. And here I would just argue that the presumption is a fantasy that's above all linked to understandings of kind of working class masculinity. And, and masculinity is before feminism, uh, before kind of modern understandings about how sexual relations and how gender relations should, should be more egalitarian. Uh, this fantasy that certain people that are outside of the progress of modernity still have access to ways of being that are, you know, less desirable in the world, but are perhaps really exciting in bed. Uh, so it's, it's, and I'm glad that people find good sex, um, but to then presume and to assert something about other people as a group uh, is to reduce them to their sociological status rather than to admit that they too could be, that everyone can potentially be an individual in diverse ways or that the ways that their sociological situation actually shapes, for example, their relationship to their body and to other people's bodies might be different. Thanks a lot, Todd, for your answers today. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Well, thanks for doing this work. Uh, it's great to listen to what you do, uh, and I'm really pleased to be part of it. And now, as usual, a few key takeaways. One, Please remember that there's always a part of history, culture, and social construct in your desire. Make sure you know more about it before starting to fetishize or sexualize someone else's body. Two, now you also know that there were highly sexualized claims about Arabs and that these claims were omnipresent in important public French discussions, both those that dealt with sex and those that spoke of Arabs. The so-called sexual revolution of mai 68 took shape in a France profoundly influenced by the ongoing effects of the Algerian revolution. Three, according to Edouard Said's work, we now know that sexual orientalism shows that sex, sexuality, and gender were crucial in the Western elaboration of an Orient that was radically different from the West and so required 
colonization. My dear listeners, thank you very much. We're coming back in two weeks, so stay tuned. Remember, you'll find all the aforesaid references in the description below, as I did every single time during season one. For the most curious minds among you, I'll put a few book and film recommendations linked to today's topic, be it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Deezer, or else. Don't forget to subscribe to Jean's podcast account and to leave your questions and comments. Go subscribe to Jean's podcast on Instagram at J-I-N-S underscore podcast. Don't hesitate to share around every time you listen to an episode because you should always remember that someone, somewhere, somewhat needs a new light shed on Islam, gender identity, sexualities, Arab origins, or anything that can be prone to oppression. So please do your part and pass the word around. See you next week.